I'm a research professor at uh, the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and I've been doing uh, patient-reported outcomes research for about 15 years or so, and I'm very happy to uh, be invited to speak to you tonight about it. This is actually a great time to be talking about this because there's so many exciting developments in patient-centered uh, research these days. And so we've got this lecture, and I think our, the, the next lecture will also be about uh, self-report approaches uh, to, uh, to research. So um, I'd like to go over a few different things today. It's a huge, huge field, but I've tried to pick out what I think are some of the most basic issues that would be useful for everyone to know. Um, first of all, why measure patient-reported health status? Um, what are the different types of patient-reported outcomes? When I say PROs, it's going to be patient-reported outcomes. Um, how are patient-reported outcome measures developed and evaluated? Because very briefly want to go over that. Um, we want to talk about some new methods for uh, doing patient-reported outcomes research using item response theory. And I put new in quotes because it's, it's new for health measurement, but it's not new for measurement in general. Education, testing folks have been doing this for a long time. So we're a little late to the game, but there are some exciting developments. Uh, so we want to mention those. Um, and then finally, uh, we want to say a word about interpreting scores that you get out of patient-reported outcome measures. Okay? So let's start with the first, why measure patient-reported health status? Um, well, let's think very generally about a situation where we're interested in trying to measure the benefits of some uh, intervention. And so how do we assess benefit? If the intervention is the kind of intervention that's supposed to act on the body, it's a, a, a pill or some procedure, um, we've got all sorts of measures that we use to assess the effect of some agent on the body, right? We've got copies of some virus in the blood, tumor size, blood pressure, peak VO2. These are all examples of these endpoints we use in studies that tell us how the body has changed, right? But for endpoints to really matter, to, to have endpoints that will inform decisions, they've got to be endpoints that are relevant to the stakeholders here, chiefly patients, clinicians, and payers. And there are probably even more stakeholders, but those are sort of the big three. And it's not always the case that some of those endpoints that we use to measure the exact effect on the body translate well into day-to-day -day functioning. So let's take peak VO2, right? Peak VO2 is a measure that's used in a lot of uh, trials for COPD or heart failure. And uh, one might ask, well, how does someone's peak VO2 relate to their, uh, the extent of physical functioning that they, they can uh, perform during their day, right? Um, well, uh, across a few different studies, we see it's, it's, uh, there's a moderate size correlation in, in one our group did, the correlation between peak VO2 and, um, uh, and, and promised physical function scores is 0.53. Um, now, if, if you want to get a little geekier on the statistics, you know, that tells you that there's about 72% of the variance in physical functioning that's not accounted for by peak VO2, right? So it's still the case that the majority of the differences among people in their day-to-day -day physical functioning is not explained by their peak VO2, right? That argues for making an assessment of their physical functioning, because we know that just measuring peak VO2 is not going to give us the best indication of how how this uh, new treatment we're testing is actually going to change their day-to-day -day lives, right? Another quick example, uh, overactive bladder syndrome, right? So for a lot of studies on overactive bladder syndrome, one of the things they'll use to measure volume is pad weight, right? They'll, they'll have people bring in their pads in Ziploc bags, whatever, and actually measure the volume that has leaked, right? Um, well, one might ask, well, what is a meaningful reduction in volume? I might have an intervention that is reducing the volume to some degree. Uh, but for a patient, what constitutes a meaningful reduction in volume? It might be uh, the case that, you know, unless you can reduce my volume to the point where I don't have to go out wearing a pad, 
I don't care. You might be very excited that it's a statistically significant reduction of 30% volume, but it's not particularly relevant to me because it's not going to drive what I'm doing so much, right? Uh, so it's not always straightforward how to assess benefit in terms of sort of these harder outcomes. And, and we want to turn to actually querying patients uh, to find out what effect some of these treatments are having on their day-to-day -day lives. So uh, when we talk about treatment benefit, you know, the FDA is quite explicit in their definition of benefit in terms of feeling, uh, function, and survival. And when we're talking about feeling and functioning, we're really in the domain now of trying to figure out what's happening in people's day-to-day -day lives. And uh, the best way to assess that oftentimes is through a patient-reported outcome measure. And we'll stick with the FDA for a second here, and, and they've got a, a very good definition. Whoops, sorry about that. No signal, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Hopefully this will work, because if it doesn't, I have a very awkward interpretive dance version of this entire talk. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, the FDA defines a patient report outcome as a measurement based on a report that comes directly from the patient about the status of a patient's health condition without amendment or interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician or anyone else. Okay? Um, and, and we're talking here about all sorts of things that match this definition. Could be uh, symptom diaries, could be multi-item uh, surveys, could be in-person interviews where responses are being recorded. The data can be captured electronically, paper and pencil, on a phone, right? All these things could be patient-reported outcome measures. And just to throw up an example of one, here's the, the NIH Promise Fatigue uh, short form, right, where we, we're asking uh, multiple items to try to get at someone's fatigue, and the responses to those items will be combined in some way to arrive at a single score that reflects their, their self-reported fatigue, right? Okay. So, um, so there we have the sort of why are we interested in patient-reported outcomes, right? Uh, let's talk about the different types of patient-reported outcomes, and uh, we're going to walk through a, a model uh, that I've adapted from uh, a wonderful article by Wilson and Cleary that was published in JAMA in 95. Um, their terminology is a little bit older, but, but it still is one that sort of drives our field. Uh, so we begin with these biological and physiological variables, and we've talked a bit about these, right? So things like CD4 count, or, uh, HbA1c, or tumor size. Again, these are things that are, are measuring how the, the state of the body or how the body has changed, right? Those bodily changes give rise to different symptoms, right? And so symptom status, like pain intensity, nausea, urinary straining, symptom status is the first time we start to see a potential for a patient-reported outcome here. Changes in symptoms can affect the person's day-to-day -day functioning. And so functional status then is sort of the next step in the causal chain. Might include things like walking or what people refer to as activities of daily living uh, or social interactions. Right? There's all sorts of ways in which the person needs to function during the day that could be compromised by certain symptoms. All right. Now, the person's symptoms and their functional status together might inform how the person sort of views their overall health. And so general health perceptions is the next type of patient-reported outcome in the chain here. And sometimes we assess that very generally with a, a simple question like one from Promise or the SF36. In general, would you say your health is excellent, very good, good, fair, poor? Um, doesn't seem like a particularly exciting item, but it's amazing that responses to this item are independent predictors of mortality after controlling for other clinical characteristics. So it's a good kind of a catch-all type of item. Um, people's overall health then 
informs their evaluations of their overall quality of life, right? And so we might uh, ask something like, overall, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Right? It's a much broader question that encompasses much more than just their health. And so we've got a lot of these non-medical factors, your financial, you know, socioeconomic considerations um, that are informing one's overall quality of life. But certainly one's health-related quality of life could be a major determinant of that. Okay? So we've got this sort of chain, this, this causal chain of patient-reported concepts here. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about these. Um, one of the things we know is that uh, any, any of these things, symptom status, the functional status, my overall health perceptions, any of those things could be influenced by other characteristics about the person. So it's not just what's happened to my body, it's not just the drug I've got or the disease I have, but there are individual characteristics. Right? Any clinician here knows that certain patients um, seem to have personalities that amplify the experience of pain. So you could have two patients with the exact same structural or physiological problem who have very different pain experiences. Right? So there are, in, there are characteristics of the individual that can also influence all these different things. And I've drawn thicker arrows there going from left to right to indicate the general understanding that these other characteristics of the person have an increasing effect as we go out here. So um, uh, the, the individual state of the body is probably not going to be as strong a determinant of one's overall quality of life as other characteristics of the person. Right? Uh, similarly, uh, not, only, not only are there interesting characteristics about the individual that influence their symptom status, functional status, their general health perceptions, but there are also characteristics of the person's environment. Right? If you think about how much your functional status is affected by the physical environment you're in, it's quite profound, right? What types of supports are there? We've got some right here, right? If I have a little bit of trouble walking, these rails are wonderful, right? And I, I might report when I got up to the top that I don't have that much difficulty going upstairs in the environment I'm in. But if you put me in an environment where you didn't have these awesome rails, I might be reporting that I have a bit more difficulty walking upstairs because there's a parentheses in the environment I'm in, right? So the environment can play a large role in the person's experience of their symptoms, the impact on their functioning, uh, their general health perceptions. And again, uh, that influence m might be increasing as we go from left to right in the, these concepts here. Okay? Um, I've talked, I've alluded to this a little bit, um, but there's an important point here. There are actually two important points here. One of the, one of the important points is that we see a dilution of effects of biological interventions as we go from left to right. right? So if I have an intervention that is to change the state of the body, it's going to change uh, some balance of chemicals in the body in order to improve the disease. Right? Or it's a surgical intervention, it's going to take something out that's causing a problem. Right? Those are changes on the body. We're going to try to observe the effects of that intervention but one of the things that's implied by this model is that the effect of that intervention will be seen most acutely in those things that I measure in terms of the, of, of the biology or physiology of the body. Right? Next it will be symptoms. Next it will be functioning. But because there are a lot of other things, other characteristics of the individual, other characteristics of their environment that contribute to symptom experience, functional status, general health perceptions, uh, that effect of that biological intervention gets diluted. And so it's harder for me to show an effect of my intervention when I'm measuring things further out here. Right? It's harder to show an effect when I'm measuring things further out because so much more contributes to it. It's just a lot messier. It's more complex. At the same time, though, uh, for many patients, those are the things they're interested in. They want to know how this is going to improve my, my functional status during the day. 
Right? It'd be really important to show that. But we're saying that it's going to probably be a little bit more difficult to show that than it would be to show symptom improvement, right? Or improvement in some blood levels of some relevant chemicals, right? Okay, so dilution of effects of biological interventions as we move from left to right. That's one of the implications of this. And another one that shouldn't be too surprising is that um, the correlation between successive boxes decreases, right? So the correlation between the biological and physical, physiological variables and symptom status is much higher than the correlation between biological and physiological variables and general health perceptions, right? Okay, so those are also things to be aware of. And again, and why is that? It's because there's all of these other things affecting the, the chain as we go down. So the further out you are, the more those things are affecting the boxes differently. Okay? So this is a, a helpful uh, overall model, I think, to try to characterize the main types of patient-reported outcomes that we might be interested in and to, to plan our study and, and, and really ask, well, what do we want to measure here? Are we inter interested just in symptoms? Are we interested in impact on functioning? Are we interested in how the person thinks about their overall health? Right. And we know now that if we're interested in things that are further out to the right, we might have to work a little bit harder to show that effect. We might have to do things like, for example, try to measure some of these characteristics in the environment and characteristics of the individual and include those in our study as a way of trying to um, uh, improve our, our measurement of our treatment effect. Right? Okay. All right, so that was what are the types of, of different PROs. Let's, let's go through a, a quick review of developing and evaluating PRO measures. And I don't want to spend too long on this, and I know that our next lecture there will be some similar um, uh, material covered. But I do want to give you an appreciation of the overall shape of how this goes, okay? Um, all right. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is to determine what PRO concept we want to measure and why we want to measure it. And let's just take the example of fatigue. Right? So a bunch of investigators are sitting around. We think we need a, we need a better fatigue measure. Right? Well, when we're all talking about it, uh, we've got a, kind of a notion of what we mean by fatigue and sort of where the boundaries of that concept might be, but it's still kind of muddy. Right? But we've got some rough concept of what might constitute fatigue. Right? But to check ourselves, though, we want to go and we want to talk to patients, and maybe their caregivers, who actually are having experiences that we think would be described as fatigue. And so the second general step is to collect some qualitative data to understand the meaning of this concept. Right? So might do focus groups or individual interviews. Talk to people about, you know, tell me, tell me what it's like to have this. Uh, uh, what's your day like? What, what, is fatigue the same as tired? All right, I'm going to talk about it. And as we do that, that fuzzy concept we have should hopefully become a bit better defined for us so that we can say that as a result of talking to folks, we now have a much clearer picture of this thing we're trying to measure. And let's try to write now a preliminary definition of fatigue and what the parts are that we're going to try to measure of fatigue. Okay. Once we've got that, we're going to need to write some items. So that's the next step. Let's write items that we think are going to measure that concept. Okay. Uh, I just put eight items here because they fit nicely on the screen, but you could write four items or you could write 400 items. It really depends on the concept you're measuring. Okay. And uh, one important thing here is that as soon as we start writing the items, We've got a preliminary measurement model. It's a preliminary model or a picture of what, how we think this, this concept is defined. Right? We think that there's this thing, fatigue, that's inside the person that is going to cause their responses to each of the items we're going to ask them. Fatigue is going to cause them to respond in certain ways. If you're more fatigued, you're going to be more likely to say, I, I, you know, I, have, I did not have the energy I needed to get things done today. Right? 
Okay, so that's our, that's our kind of picture. And by the way, there are different types of measurement models. We're not going to get into them because um, it's, it's just too mind-numbing for late afternoon, evening. But I've, I've presented the most popular type of model we see here. It's called a unidimensional model, where all of the items are thought to be measuring one thing, and that's fatigue. Okay? So I've got this preliminary model. We're going to come back to that, though. Okay? So now I've got these items that, that I and my other investigator friends wrote. Right? And they're probably awesome items, because we all have PhDs. Right? Um, absolutely wrong. Uh, some of them will be terrible items. And so the next thing we've got to do is to go test these items with the patients or, or respondents from the population uh, we are interested in studying. And we're going to sit down and talk to people about the items. We're going to ask them how they understand the item. What do they think the item is asking? Um, how do they come up with their response? Right? We want to make sure that people are thinking about these items the same way we're thinking about them. And we will definitely, as a result of that, if we do it well, find out that some of our items are really crummy and that we, we might have missed some aspects of this thing we're trying to measure. person says, well, I, I, okay, I, I don't really understand what you're getting at with this, this question, you know, but I'll tell you, that it reminds me of a much better thing to be asking here is blah, right? So I might get ideas for a new item. So a very important step to be talking with the, with the uh, patients and people with the disease to find out how they're understanding the items. Make sure we've got items that are understood by everyone the same way. Once we've got that set of, of items, we can now go and administer that set of items to a large sample of people. And we want people who have the diseases under, uh, of interest and we, we would love to get people who represent the whole range of symptom severity, right? The whole range of severity. So um, collecting data on a big set of people allows us then to use psychometric analyses, and that's just another word for statistical analyses that are specific to developing and evaluating measures. Okay? We're going to use psychometric analyses to, see how, to do a couple things here. The first thing is we want to see how well are those items working statistically, right? Remember I said we developed that sort of preliminary model. Well, we've got a whole bunch of analyses we can do to say, hey, how well do those items fit together like that? How well do the items really seem to be caused by the same thing? Or are some of these items really not hanging well with the other ones. And it may be that they're measuring something a little bit different than fatigue. Right? We do those psychometric analyses to see whether our, our items are behaving, they're working the way we thought they would work to be m telling us something about this common thing called we're calling fatigue. Right? The other reason why we're going to do psychometric analyses is uh, once we've got the right model, we want to find out how to get a score, right? We've got eight items right now, but we would like to figure out how to estimate a score for each person, one number that will now represent that person's fatigue for us, okay? Okay, um, and I'm happy to take a lots of questions afterward about more details of the types of analyses that we do. Um, they're, they're, uh, they can get a little bit squirrely, but I, I do like talking about them. So if we have time after, I'm happy to go into that. Um, then we're ready for our, our next step. Um, we've, got, we've got a measure. We think measures fatigue. We've got scores that we can get out of, out of this measure now. And now the question is to evaluate the reliability and the validity of this measure. And, and by validity here, we mean that the measure is measuring what it's supposed to measure and nothing else. Right? So we're sort of hitting the bullseye. Right? Uh, in terms of reliability, we mean here that we're measuring this thing with very little error. Right? Another word for reliability might be precision here. And so in the metaphor of a target, um, validity is how close you are to the bullseye. Reliability is how, how tight a cluster do you have. Right? Okay. 
Now, if you get into the patient report outcome literature a bit and start to look at, at tests, or, I'm sorry, measures, um, uh, you'll see that, that there are a lot of different kinds of validity mentioned. There are lots of different kinds of reliability. Um, we don't have time to go into all of them, um, uh, but I just want to make you aware of, of this. You might see, for example, reference to content validity or construct validity or responsiveness. Um, these are all different, different ways of assessing the degree to which the measure is measuring what it's supposed to measure. I'll give you one quick example of something called convergent validity. The rationale for convergent validity is that if I've got a measure that's supposed to measure fatigue, and over here is another well-established measure that is thought to measure fatigue, well, scores on my measure and the established measure should converge. They should be correlated in different samples. And so here are actual data from the NIH Promise Depression domain, some measure of depression. And uh, the distribution of scores is on the, the uh, histogram on the bottom there. And off to the left is the distribution for another really well-known depression measure, the CESD, the CESD. And um, uh, when, when we and others were developing the Promise measures, we looked at the convergence between scores on promise measures and scores on corresponding measures of the same domains here. And so we can see for this one, correlations 0.84, there's very strong convergence. Right? It gives us more confidence that the promise depression uh, measures are measuring the same type of depression that the CESD is measuring. Although, minor geek point here, if you compare the two frequency distributions, you'll see the CESD exhibits a fairly significant floor effect, we'd say. Everybody's piled up at the bottom, right? The CESD is not quite as sensitive for lower levels of depressive symptomatology, right? So, whereas it, the promised depression distribution is much closer to normal, it does a better job of discriminating among people with lower levels. So those are some other fun things we check out when we're comparing measures. Okay? So that's just an example of a, a particular kind of validity. Okay? Um, let's talk about reliability for a second, and I'm just going to go through three quick examples of reliability. The idea here is that if 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 my health state has not changed, right, if I'm basically in the exact same health, I should get the same score if, if you use different sets of items from the same measure. So if I've got a 40-item measure and those items are, are it's a reliable measure, then any random subset of those items should be giving me the same score, right? And that's known as internal consistency. If you see, ever see Chromebox Alpha, that's a measure of, of internal consistency reliability. Right? This idea that different sets of items from the same measure would all end up giving me the same score. Right? If they don't, it means some of the items aren't, aren't hanging together with the other ones too well. Um, if I've not changed, I should get the same score over time on this measure. Right? If I know my true, my true health state has remained the same, but the scores are bouncing around, that means there's, there's some error there. Right? There's just noise. That's known as test-retest reliability. Okay. And then in the special case where we've got measures that require some raters to, to uh, assign some ratings to things they observe or, or written responses people provide, it doesn't happen that often, but that kind of that, that kind of reliability is known as inter-rater reliability. It means that I'm going to get the same score on this measurement system regardless of who is scoring the thing. Right? So internal consistency, test, retest, and inter-rater reliability are three of the big kinds of reliability you see. Okay? All right. I talk fast. Again, I've caffeinated, so let's do a quick recap here. Um, we're going to determine what concept we want to measure and why. We're going to go and collect qualitative data from people to make sure that we really have defined this thing. Once we've got it defined, we can write items for it. We're going to go take the items to the actual types of people who are going to be taking this measure, find out if they understand it, 
revise the items, make sure our revisions work with new people. Then we're going to go and give the items to a whole bunch of people so that we can do psychometric analyses. And those psychometric analyses are going to allow us to test how well our, our original model fits the data, whether there's a better model we've got to use. And it's going to allow us to derive a score, right? or a set of scores maybe but some score that, that we can use. And then finally, once we're in possession of this, we can take that out and go test it now to see what kind of reliability and validity it exhibits. Okay? All right, so that was the, that was the development and evaluation process uh, in a very small nutshell. Um, so I'd like to, to now talk about some... Um, very interesting developments that have occurred in how we develop patient-reported outcome measures and some of the cool things we can do with them now. And it's especially relevant because NIH has actually invested a good deal in developing measures using some of these newer approaches. And remember I said new, it's, it's new for health but not new for uh, the measurement world. Okay? What we're going to be talking about is something called item response theory. Okay? Um, and what I want to focus on here are, is what's different between a regular old measure and a measure developed using item response theory. And then I want to tell you about one very cool little thing you could do called differential item functioning. Okay? So let's start with contrasting the different types of measures. And let's start with, here, here is, here's your basic off-the-shelf measure. This is the facet fatigue scale. Right, developed uh, by Dave Sella and, and colleagues uh, to measure fatigue, especially in cancer populations. And that, this is a great example of your traditional off-the-shelf measure. And by, I say off-the-shelf PRO measure because you just go and you grab it and you're ready to go. Everyone's going to complete the same items on the facet fatigue. Right? All of the items are necessary to obtain a score. You've got to complete all the items because you average or sum up all the items to get the score. Okay. And the score on the facet fatigue might not be on the same metric as other measures of the same thing. So for example, the SF36 has an energy domain that's supposed to be measuring about the same thing. But those scores are on a different metric. The, the, the absolute value of those scores uh, mean a different thing from the facet measure, right? It's kind of like having two different thermometers that are supposed, both supposed to be measuring temperature, but one gives it in uh, one set of numbers, and another gives it another set of numbers, and they're not comparable at all. Okay? This is what we get with traditional off-the-shelf measures. In contrast, when we use item response theory, we are able to create something called an item bank, an item bank is a large collection of items measuring a single domain, like fatigue right, or pain intensity. Okay. Any and all of the items from the bank can be used to provide a score for that domain. So you can pluck out one item and estimate a score on fatigue, or you can pluck out 40 items and combine them all and estimate a score on fatigue. Okay. Uh, that means that item banks can, can be dynamic, not fixed. We can add items to them over time. If we end up getting some better items, we can, we can uh, seed in some, some new items and maybe get rid of some items that, are, that don't seem to be quite as useful. So it's a dynamic resource. Right. Let's look at an item bank for the domain of physical functioning just as, as an example here. Um, Okay, so we, we know there's this range of physical functioning out there in the world. We know that we would like to systematically measure that range. Right? And so to do that, we will create an item bank for physical functioning. And in this case, the item bank is a collection of items that all measure physical function. Okay? And so... We've got examples here. Are you able to get in and out of bed? Are you able to stand without losing your balance for one minute? Right? Are you able to run five miles? Right? Any, any item or set of items from this bank could be used to generate a score for a person 
for physical functioning. Any of them. Um, and why is that? It's because they've, they've, we've, we've put these items through the ringer to make sure that they fit an item response theory model. It's a statistical model that allows all of these properties to hold. Okay? Um, and note here, too, that these items, as I've laid them out here, are kind of arrayed in order of severity. Right? Are you able to get in and out of bed? That's kind of a question you'd ask of a person who looked like they were incredibly weak, right? That's an item that's good for discriminating among people who are at the lower end of functioning, right? Are you able to run five miles is something that would be informative to ask of a person who's in the higher end. And this tells us another interesting property about item banks is, is that with item response theory, uh, not all items are the same. Some items are, are better used for lower severity or higher severity. And when, when we're thinking about which items we might want, we have to think about the population we're using. We have the op option to tailor our measures. More about that in a second here. Okay. So um, back to off the shelf, if I just use my traditional off the shelf measure, I take it off the shelf and I just give it to the patient or send a web link or however it is, and they all fill out the same measure and that's it. Okay? So it's really easy to figure out what to do. You take the off-the-shelf measure and administer it. Um, it's not as straightforward with an item bank because you've got some decisions. Right? Let's go through those here. Basically, I've got um, one of two main strategies here, a fixed length or, or computerized adaptive tests. With a fixed length measures, um, Everyone is going to get the same number of items. It's a fixed length for everyone, right? And I've got a couple different options there. Um, there are some very handy ready-made fixed length measures. So if you want to use measures from the NIH Promise system, you can go to the Assessment Center website and you could find ready-made short forms. These are, these are forms with um, about six to, six to ten items per domain uh, that are good for general populations. They're, they're generally sensitive to the range of functioning there that the Promise folks have picked is sort of a, a good uh, kind of off-the-shelf version of Promise measures. So there's some ready-made fixed length measures, right? I could also go in, if, I, if I've achieved the requisite level of geekness, I could go into the system and I could pick out the items that I would like that I think are going to be most sensitive for my population. Right? So if, I'm, if I've got a trial where I've got severely uh, ill heart failure patients, I don't want to be asking people how much trouble they have running five miles. It's a waste of their time, right? I'm going to go in and I'm going to select the items that are going to be most sensitive for my population, and I'm going to give everyone in my trial those items. Okay, so I could, I could tailor them. I could make my own. Um, so those are both versions of fixed length. The other, the other main way of using items from an item bank is through computerized adaptive tests. And, um, you know, a lot of you might be fami familiar with computerized adaptive testing because they use it a lot for uh, education, like the, the um, SAT, GRE, a lot of the um, uh, certificate uh, certification um, tests in, in medicine, uh, nursing, and, and uh, um, uh, government safety tests a lot, we'll just have these big banks of items and, and, and you sit down at the computer and they show you one at a time, right? So same deal here. The, the idea is that the next item that you receive is dependent upon your answer to previous items, right? And so if I've got a range of items across this, this the spectrum of severity, a, a computerized adaptive test, or CAT, might start with one right in the middle, and if I seem to have a lot of difficulty doing that, it's gonna put me on the more severe side and say, this guy sounds more severe, let me ask him a question on the more severe end and see how he answers, right? I'm gonna answer that, that's going to say, oh, it seems like it's around here. I'm going to ask a question here. And so in some ways it's very similar to the way a clinician might be asking questions of a patient. Start with a general one, 
and then as you're getting the sense of, of how severe or mild they are, ask more questions to get a more precise picture of what that person looks like. Right? But the idea with, the, with the, a cat is that, in theory, every person could get a different set of items. Right? Because the items that you get pulled out of that big item bank are the ones that are, are, are getting us to the most precise estimate of your score as quickly as possible. Right? And, and we find often that um, you can get a very precise estimate of people's scores by asking them only four questions. But they have to be the right four questions. And how do you figure out which are the right four questions? Well, uh, you have an algorithm, a computerized adaptive testing algorithm that is drawing items from that item bank. Um, having an item bank now with these different options allows a few things to happen. Uh, imagine we've got this fatigue item bank here, and it has, say, say 40 items in it. Well, um, I could use items from that item bank in all different settings, right? And I could use them in different ways, too. So uh, the chemotherapy trial might have items 1 through 10. For the osteoarthritis trial, I might be using a CAT, a computerized adaptive test, right? Uh, and what's great is because all of the items being pulled for all these different studies were from the item bank, they all have the same metric, the same meaning. The scores are comparable across all those different studies, right? Um, you, if you can imagine how that might help facilitating things like meta-analyses and, and, uh, and the like. Um, here's another great application. Right now there's a lot of interest in pragmatic clinical trials or, or comparative effectiveness research where we're trying to do research within uh, healthcare systems. I might have different healthcare systems, each, each of whom are using different measures, right? Well, right now, uh, each of those measures uh, results in a different metric, and it's really difficult to pool results then. If, however, all of those items from the different measures could be placed within an item bank, which means we, we do the kinds of item response theory analyses that test whether these guys can all sit in the same bank, and maybe we've got some other items in there, now we're in a great position because we can get one metric out of that. Right? So now even though different healthcare systems might be using different sets of items, if they're all in the same item bank, we can, we've got a crosswalk going and we can, we can get the same metric out of all of them. Right? Okay, so, so a quick review here, comparing these traditional PRO measures, the off-the-shelf measures with a, a PRO item bank, where the traditional all items are required to compute a score. With item banks, any and all subsets of the items can generate a score. With a traditional, everybody's got to take the same items. With an item bank, different people could get different items. With a traditional measure, you've got to, you can just pull it off the shelf. But when we've got an item bank, uh, you've got to use items in the bank to create measures for a specific use. And we went through some of the different options there, right? Fixed length or cats. If it's fixed, you can get ready-made ones that someone might have created for you. Or you can go and create your own custom one. Right? And uh, finally, with traditional PRO measures, the scores are not easily comparable to other scores from other measures of the same thing. Whereas with an item bank, there's much uh, greater opportunity for crosswalk between scores from different measures as long as the items from the different measures can be put in the same bank. Okay? All right. I mentioned that NIH has invested in, um, in item banks quite, quite heavily uh, and, and to great benefit, I think. A few examples here. The biggest one is probably PROMIS, uh, the Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System. And um, over about 10 years of development, uh, PROMIS has amassed quite a few uh, excellent measures of the main types of health concepts that are relevant across chronic diseases for adults and um, children and adolescents. And they're freely available. You can go to nihpromise.org for more information there. 
NIH also supported the NIH toolbox, which is for assessing neurological and behavioral function, uh, ages 3 to 85. Again, freely available. You can go to nihtoolbox.org. And finally, NeuroQual is for use in chronic neurological conditions. Um, it's free, and uh, you can go to neuroqual.org. So you might want to check, check those out and can get more information from those sites, too, about how item banks work. Uh, I said that there was a, a very cool thing you can do, there are a lot of cool things you can do with item response theory, but I wanted to tell you about a specific one. Um, it's differential item functioning, okay? So check out this very simple question, right? In the past seven days, did you cry? Yes or no, right? Um, this is, I've just made a yes-no version of, of an, a kind of item you often see in, in depression measures, right? And I, and I think that we would all agree that in general, responses to this item might inform us to some degree about the likelihood that a person might be a bit depressed. Right? The more likely you are to have cried in the last week, the more likely you are to have been depressed. This, is, this has been shown to be the case. Okay? Um, imagine that we wanted to com compare men and women's depression, though, and we had an item like this and a few other similar items, we found that men and women differed in their depression levels. What we'd like to know is that men and women truly do differ in their underlying depression levels, and not that they actually differ in the way the items work for them. Okay? So hang on for a second. We're talking about differential item function. It means the item behaves differently for two or more groups. So check this out. This is a very simple item response theory curve here. And you can see we're, we're modeling the probability of answering yes to that question on the y-axis as a function of the person's underlying depression on the x-axis. Okay? This, by the way, is why it's called item response theory. They're models of the likelihood of responding with a given answer based on your underlying level of whatever, in this case, depression, okay? So, uh, you can see here, as the person's depression, as depression increases, so too does the probability they're gonna answer yes to, did you cry in the past week, okay? And so, what we're saying when we say that this is informative about depression is we're saying, well, um, we know that of people who answer yes, those folks are most likely to be on the high end of depression, right? So we can make an inference that they're on the higher end of depression. That's how we're using that item. This, this is a map that maps the responses to that item to their underlying depression, okay? And so we take someone who is, uh, say, a, a one standard deviation above the mean of zero on depression, they've got a 0.9 probability of answering yes on that, right? Okay. So, we've said the differential item function is, is what happens when an item behaves differently for two or more groups. Another way of saying that is that the map between depression and uh, the item is different for two or more groups. I was talking about men and women with this crying item. Okay. Let's look at this. This is the map computed separately for females and males. Right. And what is it showing here? If we've got a, a, a male, a male who we know, because we've suddenly become omniscient for just a second, uh, is one standard deviation above the mean on depression, the male's likelihood that they're going to answer yes is 0.3, right? It's a 30% chance they're going to answer and say, yes, I've cried in the past week. A woman, though, who is one standard deviation above the mean has a 0.9 probability of answering yes. Now why? On average, on average, women will respond that they cried in the past week more often than men, independent of their underlying level of depression, right? But you can see how messed up you'd get here, though, if you just used one version of the map and applied it the same for males and females here. So this is an example of of differential item functioning, and when we're developing measures using item response theory, one of the things that's really important for us to do is to think, are there groups, are there groups 
for whom these items might behave differently. Would they behave differently for young versus older people? Would they behave differently for different cultural groups? Right? And we can explicitly test for that using item response theory and conducting tests of differential item functioning. And it will identify for us those items that are exhibiting differential item functioning. And then we've got a choice. We can either chuck those items if we've got other items that are just as good but don't exhibit that. We can either get rid of them or we can say, you know what, we're not going to get rid of it because it's a really informative item, but now we know we need to interpret it. We need to score it differently for men and women. Still useful, but we've got to score it differently. By the way, uh, you know, when you see tests for, for potential race bias in achievement tests and IQ tests, what they're doing is differential item functioning. They're looking to see for, for two people who are at the exact same underlying level of analytic reasoning, for example, do they have different probabilities of getting this item correct or not because of maybe different cultural backgrounds. So differential item functioning is, is very important, very, very, uh, is a really a terrific technique we've got. Okay, so that was, that was our quick little foray into some of the things that item response theory has brought us, namely measures based on item banks okay, uh, and how they differ from your traditional off-the-shelf measures uh, and some other really cool tools like being able to assess differential item functioning. Okay. Let's move on to the last section that I wanted to go over with you, interpreting scores on, on uh, PRO measures. Now, if I were doing a, a class on blood pressure here, um, I may not have to have this section on what, what's going to constitute a clinically meaningful change in blood pressure. Right? I know we're all, we all debate about what, what, where's the danger level there. Um, but... Uh, when we're talking about more clinical endpoints like that, measures that have been used in clinical practice have generated some experience there and some sense of what constitutes um, a, 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 a big change, a small change, or no change at all worth looking at. Right? We don't have that, though, with, with, with almost all patient-reported outcome measures. These are measures designed primarily for research. Clinicians don't have a lot of experience using them. We haven't generated the experiences that we need in order to understand what might be a, a, a big or small change, right? Um, I want to go through an, a quick example here. This was a, a study that we did. Uh, it was published in JAMA um, a while back. And uh, this was the HF Action uh, trial for heart failure. And they compared exercise intervention with usual care and the primary outcome was survival, but secondary outcomes were uh, um, uh, physical functioning and, and overall quality of life. Um, and here I'm going to focus on changes in a measure called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, which is validated to measure cardiomyopathy outside of Kansas City, by the way. So um, I've never made that joke before, and now I know why. It's not a funny joke at all. So uh, the difference between the groups was uh, 1.93 with a 95% confidence interval. There we go. Right? And the conclusion there is that the exercise arm has a statistically greater rate of change between baseline and three months. Right? 1.93. So, so what? what? What are we to make of this? How, how does this parameter relate to day-to-day -day functioning? Is it a clinically meaningful, is it a policy-relevant effect that has been detected? Right. Well, um, there are several options for trying to answer this question. Uh, and actually, there's some exciting work developing uh, new options to do that. I just want to give you one quick example of, of a strategy some people use uh, to answer this type of question. Right. Um, and the rationale here is that, well, if I'm not sure what changes in scores on this measure mean, one thing I can do is to sort of get a point of reference by looking at changes on something I do understand and seeing how changes in my scores map to the thing I do understand. It's called an anchor method. I find some other measure I understand better and see how it's related to my patient report outcome scores. Right? 
So in this case, the developer of the, uh, of the uh, Kansas City measure was John Spurtis, and um, he and colleagues published an article where what they did was they, they had cardiologists make an assessment six months uh, after treatment uh, of the uh, change in their patient's health. Right? And they could rate uh, no change or large, moderate, or small deterioration, or small, moderate, or large improvement. Right? Those are the options. So there's a seven-point scale saying, tell us you know, how, your, how your patient's uh, cardiac health uh, has, has changed over the last six months. Okay? And for all of those patients, those patients all took the Kansas City of Cardiomyopathy questionnaire at baseline and when they came in for a six-month visit. Okay? And so what we're able to do then, what they were able to do, is to look at the change in, change in score between baseline and six months and look at all the folks who were described as having large deterioration and look at what their mean change was in moderate deterioration, right? And so here are the results of that. The mean change is on the uh, y-axis there with the zero right in the middle. And I draw your attention to these two areas here. This is, these are the, the mean changes in Kansas City score that correspond to times when the physician said there was a small deterioration and patients who, for whom the physician said there's a small improvement. Right? And coincidentally, they're both about a five-point change. One's a five-point improvement, one's a five-point decline in, in score. Okay? Doesn't always work out that way, um, but in this case it did, so it's kind of nice. So, so in this case, we're able to say, well, you know, it looks like about, a, on average, a five-point change from baseline seems to correspond to the clinician's perception, at least that this person had some small but noticeable improvement or small but noticeable decline. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that five is a holy number or anything, no, but it's, a, it's just a helpful point of reference, right? That's just, that's all we need. And so we can use that in, in uh, when, when we express the results from this, we plotted the distribution of change scores as change from baseline is on the x-axis, right? And the frequency and percent is on the y-axis. And we plot that separately for the exercise and the usual care arms there. And recall that the difference the difference here uh, was 1.93. Right? It's kind of like the difference of the means of those distributions. Right? Uh, this, this is a little more informative, though, because we can draw a reference line at 5, at a, an improvement of 5. Right? Again, it, maybe it's 6, maybe it's 4. You know, it's, we're, we're not pretending that there's anything exact about this, but just to help us get a sense we know that a five on average was when clinicians said, I'm noticing an improvement, right? So we can draw that reference line there. We can, we can find out what percent of people in each trial arm uh, ha exceeded that, right? In this case, in the exercise group, 54% of folks exceeded that compared to 29% of control. It helps us just get a, a sense of what happened in this study with respect to these Kansas City scores, right? And as I say, there are other, there are other uh, approaches to trying to um, uh, create meaning around the, uh, the scores you get. Uh, this is just one example of those. Right? But I think the important point is that efforts have to be made when you have a new measure to actually try to figure out um, what, what will constitute a meaningful change or a meaningful difference. Right? Okay. So let's quickly review here. Uh, we, this is kind of a high-speed uh, survey of some, some key points in the field. Um, we talked about the value of measuring patient-reported health status and, and uh, the different types of patient-reported outcomes summarized by that Wilson-Cleary model, right? and that idea of the dilution of effects going from left to right in that that model and all the other stuff about the individual and about the environment that contribute to the patient reported outcomes that we might observe. Right? Uh, we talked about the different steps for developing and evaluating 
uh, patient reported outcomes. And uh, also went into some depth about some new developments in the field that have arisen as a result of applying item response theory to health measurement and the creation of item banks to allow us to more efficiently assess health. Uh, and then finally, we talked about the importance of, of doing something to help us interpret the, the clinical or policy relevance of changes or differences in scores on, on patient report outcome measures because uh, they're strange metrics. They're not used in clinical practice routinely right now, and uh, we don't have the body of experience that allows people to look at it and say, well, that's, yeah, that's actually a worth a difference. That's a difference worth paying for, right? Uh, okay. I think of that we've got some, some time for questions through Arnie. Everyone's stunned. Yes, sir. So one of the questions that comes to mind when you are designing a video frame depending on patient reported outcomes is that do you take in consideration the effect of time you know, in reporting by patients? Um, so say you are going back to look at crime for a week, but when you look at more subtle things, there should be a timely bias in this as a recall bias, if you wish. So when you design these things, if you're looking at, for example, depression in elderly, cognitive decline could be you know, a confounding factor. What, uh, what a great point. So the, so, so the comment or the question was, um, what about the element of time in the re reporting? Items usually have a recall period in the past seven days or in the past month. And to what extent is that a concern that there may be inaccuracy in that reporting? And a great point was raised that, that in, a, in a population like very elderly, where you might have memory problems, might we be asking the, the system to report on something that's beyond its ability? Um, what a great question. And, you know, um, I didn't include it in the evaluation process there, but it is increasingly the case that people will do a recall study. Uh, and uh, this has been done for a number of the PROMISE measures. We conducted one for the PROMISE sexual function measures, um, where, where you'll have people make daily ratings of whatever it is you're measuring over, say, a month. And at the same time, they'll do weekly ratings and maybe a monthly rating, and there are very complex designs you can come up with here, but the, the idea is to look at the correspondence between a seven-day recall and daily recall, average daily recall. And so the short answer is yes, it's very important. It can be evaluated empirically. Um, the FDA is, in, is, is very interested in evidence that someone can, can record accurately. And, and there's some really interesting results showing the types of, of, of recall biases people exhibit, right? The last few days are often more influential uh, in determining their report, right? The mood they're in at the time they take the measure is more, uh, uh, might be related to their, uh, their reports, right? So this is, this is an emerging science, uh, but a very important aspect of, of this. I'm so glad you brought that up. I didn't include that. Right? What other comments or questions do folks have? Yes, sir. How do you determine what a baseline is? People can really be different. I mean, when you go to see a doctor and they say, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is the pain? Well, 6 or 7, if you don't have a measurable, comparable scale that you can use for benchmark. So, yeah, so, so the question uh, is how do you establish a, a sort of an absolute baseline when, when people, people's subjective sense of what a 6 is, for example, could vary among people, right? Is that, is that a good? Uh, so great, great question. I mean, the, here, is the, here is the essential fact. I was going to say problem, but it's not a problem. It's a feature. Uh, the fact of having a subjective report is the measure. Um, we, could, we could go and try to say, well, all right, let's get measures of your C fibers between these two people who both answered a six, 
uh, and find out that the magnitude of firing of sea fibers is, is different between the two, and that might be interesting. But that's awfully expensive. I'm not sure what you're going to do with it. Uh, what, what a lot of people will do in this case is to say, well, let's, uh, let's do a longitudinal design, and each person's their own control, right? Another option is to um, sometimes have people rate different reference states. So if, if they are, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they might be rating how bad they think it would be to be in this other state, and then you can compare what people said there and just, but it gets a little bit, a little bit wonky. I think it's, it's better to just use people as their own control. Um, it is also the case, too, though, that, you know, some of those differences between people are exactly the things we're trying to measure. If I've got two people whose, whose uh, bodies from the neck down are identical, but, but one's giving me a pain intensity rating of 4 on a scale of 1 to 10, and the other is saying 8, those are different experiences that people are having, and, and some of it may be because they use the scale a little differently, but a, a lot of it may be due to this, this. It's a different experience, and that's why we're asking them, uh, because it's that experience that is probably driving behavior like seeking care. Right? Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Do you see a lot of uh, studies going Yeah, absolutely. The question was, do we see a lot of studies going to mobile devices for their PROs? I know, I think in the next lecture, there's going to be a little bit more on different modes of administration, but absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the ability to um, use an iPad in the clinic or use phones uh, that people are out walking around with is very exciting, especially to be able to measure real-time things. You know, instead of me asking you, what, how, are the, well, how have the past seven days been? I could actually ping you every now and then with a very short uh, thing a few times a day now. So that is absolutely of tremendous interest, uh, and there's a lot of, of exciting applications being developed to do that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. When we have patients reporting this as an outcome, how do you measure the outcome? Is that the second thing? Uh, the question is, is there, uh, when we have a patient reported measure, um, what's a protocol deviation related to that measure? Is there one? There, there absolutely is. I mean, if, if, the, if we're requiring that the person complete at least one item uh, and they've not completed any and the study coordinator was supposed to make sure they completed some or they answered the question that says, I'm not answering these because... Uh, that might be uh, viewed as a protocol deviation. Uh, if another example is, you know, um, sometimes the timing of when they answer the measures during a clinic visit is critical. Um, so let's say I'm doing a heart failure study and I've got a guy going through a stress test. Well, their answers to their physical, you know, how's their physical function? right when they come in the clinic, are going to look a lot different probably than right after they finish the stress test where they're not feeling so hot, right? So if I'm designing that protocol, the thing I'm measuring is what was their functioning like the week prior to coming into the clinic. I want them to take the measure right away. If in that visit we find out that that measure was, they forgot to administer at the beginning of the visit, they did their stress test, and then they administered it afterward, that's a problem, right? And there are other things you might think of. But so, yes, there, there, it is possible to have protocol deviations related to patient-reported outcomes. Other questions or comments? Okay. Well, hey, thank you. You guys have been so attentive at this, uh, this late hour. I appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>